When the great Maori chief Wikipedia told his iwi of his plans to fashion a gigantic sculpture here on the west coast, they scoffed at him. And although this clever geometric abstract statement of separation anxiety stands as his monument, it was surely one of our greatest acts of folly. While the Punakaiki sculptures now impress horny Scandinavian tourists, it's clear that old Wiki wasted his life whittling away at these rocks. Old Wiki would whittle well into the night and would sometimes miss his kai or dinner. But while his original sketches hint at mental illness, the work has made locals mad in another way. Partly because it attracts Germans, and partly because it clogs the highway with road maggots, or camper vans. But as far as homegrown folly goes, Wiki's Punakaiki is pretty harmless stuff. A year before its completion, in 1959, many believed that Auckland's Harbour Bridge was destined to become our greatest folly. But whilst this would be the site of a financial disaster, it would involve not a bridge, but an immigrant from Wolverhampton and a troupe of dancing Maori. Hi, I'm Suzanne Paul. This is my new venture. It's Ra Waka. Come on, I'll show you around. Look at this, isn't it gorgeous? Had this specially made. It's my indoor pahutakawa tree. So it's flowering all year round. And then we've got the only living indoor Maori village. A Maori village. Suzanne Paul and a Maori village with real live Maori. Watch them weaving. Watch them, watch them cooking kai. Watch them partaking of pea at the pea furry. <laughs> you know? They're, oh, they're stupid. You can't get this anywhere else in the world. People are going to come from all over the world to see this. And I guarantee by the summer, this will be Auckland's number one tourist attraction. Unfortunately, it wasn't a money-back guarantee. And in the end, Suzanne's Maori village didn't last as long <laughs> as another unorthodox Maori village at Motua Gardens in Whanganui. They've been here four weeks, 200 people and 50 tents, tucked between the Whanganui River and the district courthouse, a controversial land claim right in the heart of the city. We've all been working very hard at uh, creating harmony in the community. The occupation revealed another great folly of our time via the mayor of Whanganui and his remarkable rug. Clearly, it was a folic folly. But Kiwi men have a long history of toupee trickery and hairpiece hijinks. So it's real hair, Martin? It's uh, hair from Europe. Like much of the illegal hair smuggled into this country, Martin's probably began its life atop the head of a gypsy in Odessa then taken by courier or mule across Persia to a black market in Ceylon and then onto New Zealand by boat via Van Diemen's Land. Is it a toupee or is it for real? <laughs> Martin Crow looking really bad with his bad hairdo. <laughs> That's part of being a man, isn't it? <laughs> what, having hair or going bald? <laughs> going bald. <laughs> While Martin Crow is at the top of the toupee table, it's the great Koro Witri who is the undisputed Komatua of the Komova. The former government minister didn't need the hair of dead European children to furnish his forehead. Following his party's philosophy, he simply redistributed what he had. Oh. Koro was also one of the stars of the 80s satirical puppet show Public Eye, where he was immortalised in latex along with the rest of the third Labour government. Let the bathrooms be locked for an hour! The most famous comb-over would have to be Koro Wetteru. 
And that was extreme. And as he got older, you know, it went lower and lower because it had to, until so ultimately it was going from there. Like, you know, Robin Hood, Robin the Rich, feed the poor. But the comb over was not the most serious affliction to befall the populace. In the late 60s, a new and frightening health problem reared its ugly head. Health authorities became alarmed by a sharp increase in the number of women suffering from distended genitalia. A worried government commissioned a royal inquiry. The Freeman Report confirmed the government's worst fears. New Zealand women were suffering an epidemic of acute extrinsic inflammation of the labial cortex, or camel toe. Many sufferers were unaware of their disorder, and the problem went unchecked for years, reaching epidemic proportions. By 1985, New Zealand had the highest rate of camel toe in the OECD. But in 1989, a pioneering GP from the West Coast made a crucial breakthrough. In a private study, Dr. Stephen Ukon established a connection between the incidence of tight pants amongst West Coast women and labial cleft. Thankfully, we now know what causes camel toe. It's the simple folly of overly tight garments. But while catastrophic mistakes like this are easily undone, the effects of others have proved tragically irreversible. This film strip from 1931 tells the story of a very different form of folly. The folly of our introduced species is well documented, but as bad as the gorse and the possums were, they had nothing on the most devastating creature ever visited upon this land, the cat. Isn't that right, Puss? <coughs> Stevens Island in the Cook Strait. Barren, its only sound, the murmur and howl of the sea. A safe haven in splendid isolation until the arrival of Mr. Whiskers. When the lighthouse keeper wanted a cat for company, a darkness fell on the island like four soft but lethal paws. The tuatara could run, the petrel could hide, but the Stevens Island wren, flightless and pathetic, soon became extinct. The irony is that Mr. Whiskers actually discovered the bird, until then unknown to exist. The tragedy is that he then ate the last of this rare species like jelly meat. It was an ornithological holocaust. All that remains of the wren are its bones, buried on the bleak shores of Stevens Island, a desolate grave where birds succumbed to man's blunderings. The following is a party political broadcast on behalf of the National Party. Tonight, freedoms. Exactly 80 years later, cats would take centre stage in a political squabble that some say swung the 1975 election. In 1972, 
the Labour government passed a law banning cats from dairies. To National, it was another example of political correctness gone mad. Like the ones that say you can only build a little house or that you can't have your cat in your shop anymore. We highlighted a series of half a dozen issues, made them very simple, very straightforward, and said uh, we're on this side, the government's on the other side, uh, and we think the public are on our side, and in most of them they were. One, obviously, was national superannuation. On becoming the government, national will immediately abolish the Labour superannuation scheme. Another one was we said we'll let cats into shops. Uh, they had a crazy uh, idea that uh, cats weren't to be allowed in shops. And my gosh, all the fuss that it created all over the country. And that was a simple issue. We said, we'll let the cats into the shops. We'll do away with the regulations that limit the size of the house that you want to build. And we'll even bring back the cats. The issue licked New Zealand like an unusually rough tongue and even led to the hugely popular musical Cats in the Shops. Now it's midnight and I'm closing the poor square. But my money gets out there and for midnight inside the workplace. Because of party labor, party legislation, and I'm lonely left inside. The one man tour de force performed by the late Harvinder Singh ran for a record six weeks at Downstage Theatre. The issue also surfaced in an episode of the popular situation comedy, Dr. Rangi. I hope you don't mind, Dr. Rangi, but I brought my cat with me. Not at all, Mrs. Pubisher. Take a seat. Really, Mrs. Pubisher, you should know it's illegal to have cats in the workplace. I know, dear, but it helps me keep calm if I can stroke my pussy. <laughs> Nurse, speculum. Oh, Mrs. Pubisher, your pussy's off. I'll say. I can smell it from here. Oh, Dr. Rangi. <laughs> One of our greatest follies was surely the highly experimental New Zealand space program. And it, too, involved animals. Most people have never heard of the New Zealand space program. It was not something the government wanted to crow about. I mean, it was very expensive. In the 1970s, New Zealand made an unlikely entry into the space race when it sent a four-year-old Perindale cross named Daisy into outer space. DSIR scientists hope to learn about the effects of zero gravity on pregnant ewes. The machine is designed to simulate the effects of space travel on the animal, and DSIR scientists say that Daisy is shaping up well. Yesterday, the minister told a packed news conference... The launch of the module Wecker 9 on June 17, 1971, stopped the nation. The cross down live to Lindsay Ellen. Wellington for the liftoff. Two, one, ignition. We have liftoff. Wicker 9 is clear. Tower, Wicker 9 is clear. Right on. Despite a wonky takeoff, the module eventually made it to space. However, disorientated by the launch, the distressed U had soon taken Wicker 9 dangerously off course. In breaking news, concern tonight for Wecker 9. It's been confirmed the module is now off course. We'll bring you further updates as they come to hand. In a desperate attempt to salvage the mission, scientists hurriedly deployed a second module. Wecker 10 contained a sheepdog called Bluey. 
It was hoped the highly trained fox terrier might be able to herd Daisy back onto course in a kind of cosmic dog show. Stay blue. Stay blue. Wait there, blue. Wait there, blue. Come round, blue. Sadly, both Wekka 9 and Wekka 10, the module containing Bluey the sheepdog, were lost forever. The only reminder of those ill-fated missions is this. It's the booster rocket that sent poor old Daisy into space. And it now rests here at Auckland's Museum of Transport and Technology. A forgotten and melancholy testament to man's hubris. Our only other space venture saw New Zealand become the first country to send a time capsule of its television into outer space. It was hoped that if alien life did exist, they might learn about us from our television programs. Sadly, the capsule's contents were involved in a last minute mix up, which meant that instead of Billy T. James, the aliens might now be watching Loey's Barbecue. But, as we'll soon see, folly is often in the eye of the beholder. There is much to be proud of in this nation of ours. The wild of the wilderness. The middle class comforts of suburbia. And the beauty of our agricultural endeavours and to a lesser extent forestry. But as you walk the earth in God's own, it's also clear that this is a country full of monuments to folly, symbols that help us create the illusion of permanence. Our need to believe in an afterlife has led to many ecclesiastical edifices some grand and grandiose, and some just plain inspired. Like this replica of Noah's Ark in Christchurch. The Ark, which also doubles as a function room, is set in the grounds of Gethsemane Gardens, atop the hills in Christchurch. The gardens are a testament to the determination an imagination of man in awe of a higher power. In fact, religious belief has been behind many of our most eccentric countrymen and has led to many such follies. For over 30 years, New Zealanders could rely on one man to reassure us of the enduring triumph of the human spirit. Publisher A.H. Reid discovered this country on foot at an age when he ought to have been tucked up in bed, gibbering senile nonsense. Reid's claim to fame was that he walked the length of the country when he was fucking old. He was as steady as the tides and his fame grew like a rural legend. He battled wind and rain and the infirmities of age. He even saw off the fish-eyed probings of porcine interviewer David Beetson. Are you aware that it's going to involve you in a considerable amount of publicity? No, I don't think that really enters into it. But Reed was a Christian zealot. As a celebrity, he lent his name to anti-abortion, anti-homosexuality, and pro-censorship movements. As the greatest pedestrian in New Zealand history, he made it his mission to inculcate the young with the teachings of Christ. There was a young lady of Butte who played on a silver gilt flute. Flute, very good. It was pure folly. We loved him 
and treasured him. But part of the thrill was waiting for him to drop dead. I'll see you again, boys. Mm. Bye, bye, nurse. Goodbye. Elfried finally popped his clogs at 100 in a sleeping bag on his front porch. No longer onwards, but possibly upwards. Many scholars believe that much of our folly has been a byproduct of our self loathing, such as this attempt to amass some 2,000 tractors in Ashburton. And it's because of that intrinsic insecurity that New Zealanders have become world leaders at unorthodox world records like this one. Even though we've achieved little as a nation, we seek solace through world record attempts using tractors, bloody big fritters, putting Haast on the map as home to the world's largest white bait patty, and even bacon and egg pies. <laughs> And whilst the Greeks gave the world democracy and the Chinese the printing press, we can at least lay claim to the world's largest chocolate log, constructed at the Kumu Wine Festival in 1979. No matter what undertakings we undertake, it's clear that many New Zealanders are hopelessly bereft of even a modicum of common sense. For this country is built on balls ups and blunders that defy definition and beggar belief. In this, our Aotearoa, land of folly.